Good evening. Can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me? Jim Johnson, can you hear me? <laughs> you appear to be the furthest away from me. Yes, great, great. If you can hear me, then everybody can hear me. Good. Hi, my name is Eric Myers, and I'm the director of the Chattanooga Design Studio, and I want to send a warm welcome to each and every one of you for being here tonight. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight for this, this wonderful installment of Civic. It's, it's, a, it's just wonderful to see everybody's faces after all that we've been through and have to spend time apart to be all in one place, especially for the topic that we had this evening. And um, so anyway, I'm just honored to be here with you all for the same purpose, um, to be educated and to enlighten ourselves and to inspire ourselves to do better here in Chattanooga. That's what Civic's all about. So if you don't know me, again, my name's Eric Myers. I'm with the Chattanooga Design Studio. If you don't know the Chattanooga Design Studio, I have two seconds, and I promise I won't take a long time. One thing about nonprofits, so we are a nonprofit urban design resource for Chattanooga. That means we're, we're funded privately and publicly. Um, one thing about nonprofits is that we have missions. We have mission statements. And if you want to know about that, mission, that nonprofit, take a look at that mission statement, pull out the verbs of that statement, and that's typically what that nonprofit wakes up every day to do and to make an impact in, in, in the world in which they work. So our mission statement is to improve the quality of life for all Chattanoogans by educating for, advocating about, and facilitating high quality urban design. Did you hear the verbs? Yeah. And so we can think about facilitating in the way that we engage people in the design process, the way that we engage uh, people in thinking about the future of their communities, uh, the way that we engage um, our public spaces to be better performing spaces for everyone. We can think about advocacy in the way that we prompt people to think about their neighborhoods, the places that they live, the places that they work, the places that they play, parks, outdoor spaces, particularly the public realm, those places that we share our public life with one another. How do we improve them together? How can they be better spaces that foster our own personal uh, benefit for well-being, and how can they be better places where we meet with one another and share time with one another? And then we learn. We learn together, right? We learn together about how to make a, a community better, um, and we learn from others uh, in this community, and that's what Civic is all about. Civic has been now, I'm real, really proud to say, and, um, and with great gratitude to the Lindhurst Foundation and other supporters that you've seen on the slides tonight, such as Regan Smith, um, and the Camp House for supporting us for, as a location for over the years. We are really grateful to have five years of this program running now, of bringing high quality, thank, yes, thank you. Five years, over 20 speakers from across the nation coming here to inspire us and do exactly what we're gonna do tonight. So I'd be remiss if I didn't do my duty in announcing that we, we do have some esteemed elected officials with us tonight, first and foremost, uh, Chairman Councilman Ledford. Councilman? Thank you for being here. Councilman Jenny Hill. Ah, thank you for being here. Councilman from my district. Thank you. Councilman Marvin Noel, one of my best friends. Marvin, right in the front row. I'm sorry, these lights, my gosh. Uh, and, and so um, with that, and uh, Chief Murphy is here this, tonight as well, right? Did I see Chief? Chief, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for everything you do. Uh, all of our elected leaders, Chief Murphy, thank you for what you do for our community and your service. So without further ado, I told you I wouldn't be very long and very brief. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to David Chalker to talk a little bit about Civic and introduce our speaker. So thank you again for being here. For those of us that were at a different venue last night, Eric was concerned about, can you hear him? I'm just concerned, can you see me right now? <laughs> Bit of an inside joke. I'm David Chalker. I'm the outreach coordinator for the Chattanooga Design Studio. Welcome to Civic. Civic is a speaker series honoring Robert Taylor. Regarding Civic, please save the date for our February 16th Civic event. Details to be announced and decided, okay? Please put that on your calendars. We hope to see you all again in February. Civic is a quarterly event which introduces and humanizes national and international movements in urban design by showcasing visionary work being done by practitioners around the world. At the Chattanooga Design Studio, 
We believe urban design can improve the quality of life for all Chattanoogans. It's not just something academic, okay? All Chattanoogans. Tonight's conversation is part of that vision. A big thank you to our sponsors again, Lenders Foundation, Reagan Smith, and Camp House. It's my pleasure to introduce Mitchell Silver. Mitchell served as the commissioner for the New York Department of Parks and Recreation, and is currently a principal with McAdams, a land planning and design company. Incidentally, a fun fact, he currently, well not, sorry, previously in his role in New York City, he sat in the, the office in the same chair as Robert Moses. That's kind of interesting. Um, Aside from his, his current work with McAdams, he's also been a very valued guest of Chattanooga this week. It's been a pleasure to have you here. I think everyone would agree to that. We'd love to have you stay a few more days or come back and see us maybe in the new year. Um, one of the things that Mitchell mentioned when we were first having conversations about his visit, he says, I want to start a conversation. Um, and that begins tonight with his thoughts on planning for a 21st century parks and public spaces. What's next? Please give a big Chattanooga welcome to Mitchell Silver. I have to put these on, I seriously cannot see any of you. Well, first, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. And I want to thank everyone for the wonderful welcome last night at our panel and the tour today. Thank you, Eric, and your team at the Design Studio. Thank you, Scott, and your team at Parks and Outdoors. And want to commend the city for reinstituting the Parks Department. I was stunned when I found out it went dormant. As you will hear in my presentation, why I feel the way I feel. So you all know I'm an urban planner by training, a planner all my career. And uh, I remember when Mayor de Blasio called me in North Carolina and said, would you want to come to New York City and be parks commissioner? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, why? I said, because parks is 80% operations and 20% planning. I'm a planner. And he said, that's why I want you. We have to rethink parks in the 21st century. And so I said, yes. Now, all my planner friends teased me and said, you sell out. How could you leave planning and go to parks? You know, it really hurt my feelings, but it wasn't until a conference in New York, a planning conference, after being commissioner for a few years, you know, I told the audience of about 5,000 planners, you know, people literally hug you for opening up a park. I mean, literally hug you. In my entire career as a planner, no one ever hugged me for creating a comprehensive plan. <laughs> so, if you want a hug, open up a park. So as you all know, uh, I'm a New Yorker, but lived in North Carolina, so I talk straight with hospitality. But I'm gonna share with you uh, at least my perspective of being in the park space, and I have to say, it changed me. I have this newfound respect, and COVID even elevated my respect even more. Watching how so many cities and towns and villages were able to cope with some of the isolation by a park system. But I want to take you first to a journey of how do we get to where we are today. If we go back to Europe, they started with parks and gardens. In fact, as I go to Europe and Australia, they still call it parks and gardens. These were spaces you didn't sit or picnic. You strolled through them to enjoy nature, observe it. It wasn't a space you had to interact. It were parks and gardens that you just experienced and you flowed through. Then we moved into the amazing period of the mid 19th century, early 20th century, when for the first time, we had this emerging profession called landscape architecture that started to shape land for people. You're looking at Bethesda Terrace in Central Park, and Umstead wanted these public, democratic, free spaces where everybody could enjoy, and that transformed the map of the United States. Everyone wanted these parks, and landscape architecture led the way. Then we get to where my tush sat for several years, Robert Moses, in his chair and in his office. But then we had the recreational era. Parks and recreation started during this period. And Robert Moses, there were two, pre-war and post-war. We love the pre-war. We don't really like the post-war very much. So let's focus on the pre-war. 
He saw hundreds of people dying in the East River just to cool off and decided to build these facilities for recreation to save lives. Children were getting killed in the street through cars and horse carriages and created these playgrounds. That's the recreational facilities era, and that went from 1930 to 1965. Let's forward now to the end of the, really the late 20th century. And as we all know, just like you went through, the industrial and manufacturing industry declined. Chattanooga, Pittsburgh, we got a gut punch. But we were left with all this industrial land that needed to be healed. And what I love about this industrial land, because most often our backs faced the river, people now embraced and healed the land and gave it back to the public to enjoy. You're looking at industrial land that was on the west side of Manhattan, now Riverside Park. And you see this happening place after place after place. And who knew an abandoned railroad on the west side, now called the High Line, would now give you spectacular views that you can experience along a 1.5 mile walk was an industrial area. Being transformed in Chattanooga, that's your roots. You have those industrial properties, and I went on a tour, and I see how you're healing some of those places to give those experiences back in the public. And I grew up in Brooklyn. This is Brooklyn Bridge Park. It used to be a terminal and a shipyard. To be at that location and experience that view, to me, was transformative. And now you can literally kayak, and I did, in the East River. That's the power of parks. That is the evolution from the 18th century to the early tw late 20th century. The big question is, what's next? Now, I often, as a planner, like to watch these emerging trends because as parks changed, issues changed, and we as planners and designers need to respond to the changing issues of our time. This list constantly changes, and we're dealing with droughts and wildfires and flood, a public health crisis, racial and social justice, we now have to respond to these issues. 20 years from now will be something different, but we have to recognize that parks change, their roles change, and we need to change with it. And this is something that is extremely powerful. Now I'm gonna stop here. This is the last slide I'm gonna show about how big New York City park system is. I don't want you to focus on New York City, just to show you what I had to manage for seven and a half years. New Yorkers love their parks. And so uh, we invested a lot. If you didn't, you probably wouldn't get reelected. That parks and schools and libraries were on the top of the list. You didn't fund them. You probably wouldn't make it to the next election. 30,000 acres, 10,000 acres of natural areas, close to 2,000 parks. We actually had rec centers, which were critical outreach where we would connect with the community. And I think I've heard that community centers are one agency and parks the other. <sniffs> Got to bring those together. They work together, and that's our greatest way for the Parks Department did amazing connections, particularly in underserved communities through those community centers. And you can see our budget, 7,000 employees, $600 million for our agency. Don't get jealous, it's New York. <laughs> and my capital budget of 10 years was $4 billion. <laughs> but this was our portfolio. In New York, our parks were front yard, our backyard, our outdoor living rooms. It's where people connect. And so for us, it was important that we had to manage this system because it meant so much to New Yorkers. And I told my staff, we're not just a department of parks and recreation, we're a department of fun, health, and happiness. We're not the fire department, God bless them. We're not the police department or public works. We're a department of fun. And so we had to talk to all of our employees about changing your attitude. How do you respond to someone who's upset, healthy, happy, and fun? And every city should have a department of fun. Do you have one here in Chattanooga? I have a feeling you're gonna get one very soon. All right. So the big question is what's next? We saw the evolution, but what's next? So for me, I believe in the 21st century, Parks are not just green spaces that sit in isolation. They're outdoor living rooms, so social gathering spaces. And it's not just amenity, it's now a vital part of the city's infrastructure. And we found that out during COVID, how essential our parks and green spaces were. It's the first line of defense against climate change. In New York City, 525 miles of our city, we're a coastal city, is basically near the water, and 155 miles were in parks. And so we came up with different ways of protecting people and protecting property. 
It's not just for physical health, but for mental health as well. And finally, it's an economic driver in so many cases. New York City, we get 130 million visits to our parks every year. Disney can't even come close. So because I'm limited on time, this was our strategic direction in New York City to talk about equity, access, inclusion, planning and placemaking. I want to talk about resiliency and sustainability. You're going to have to invite me back. And then caring for parks. And let me just say, when I became commissioner, leading with a culture of care became so important. There's a difference between maintenance and care. My daughter's on her way to North Carolina. I'll see you tomorrow. When I raised her, I didn't maintain her. I cared for her. Caring comes from a different part of the soul. And we have volunteers that were coming to our parks to give up their time. That's care. So we have to understand maintenance is important, it's a checklist, but caring is different. So these are words I've been in this space for the past 30 years. I met Tamara, so I do know you have an equity officer, very pleased about that. And so since I've been doing this, I have working definitions because different parts of the country react very differently when they see these words, especially post Black Lives Matter and the death of George Floyd. So I'm gonna give you my working definition I've been using for well over 10 years. In terms of diversity, the value of different perspectives. Sit. Black, white, young, old, Hispanic, Native American, immigrant, political affiliation, orientation, ability, disability, you want to make sure you have the value of different perspectives as you make decisions. Equity, simple word, fairness. Is it fair? Whether you're a child or an adult, you all understand what is fair and what is not fair. Inclusion must be welcoming to all. And then access, removing barriers, and I'll go through this a lot more. What is powerful about these words, diversity, equity, and inclusion is not something you do, it's who you are. I met Tamara, I was very excited, but the mission of equity cannot be delegated to an office or a person. It has to be leadership, it has to be embraced by all. It's not what you do, it's who you are. If I say, let's have a campaign on kindness, really, either you're kind or you're not kind. <laughs> let's have a mission statement, we need to be kind, really? These are the values, it's who we are. So everything you see, I came to New York with this lens, looking at the very same thing everybody was looking at for decades. But I came with that because this is who I am, it's not something that I do. So we already mentioned equity, it means fairness. So when I came to New York, you may have heard, there was a state senator that says, I got it will go to the richest conservancy and ask them to give 10 to 50% of their budget to fund underserved parks. And I said, no, Mayor, that's, that's not gonna work. You got six months to come on a solution. We came up with this idea of a framework for an equitable future. Really the first parks department that figured out how to address equity. But we had to figure out how to do it. In New York City, the city spent over 20 years close to $6 billion improving its parks. That's multiple mayors and councils. We acquired land and came up with this walk score that everyone from TPL needs to be within a walking distance to a park. However, I was troubled by that metric. Be careful of metrics. It wasn't just about proximity, it was about quality. There were some parks within a 10 minute walk, I would not let my child or grandchild step foot in that space. But it counted on the metric. And so we decided that we weren't gonna poll anyone. God bless our elected officials. We said, let us use a data-driven approach to find out over the past 20 years, $6 billion, were we fair on how we invested in our parks? So it turned out, out of all of our parks, we wanted to find out how many of our parks received less than a quarter of a million dollars over 20 years. And to our surprise, there were 215. Neighborhoods that were frozen in time, from kindergarten to college, no change. While they saw other parks getting new amenities, and new play equipment, and new goalposts, and new soccer fields, theirs was frozen in time. And the mayor and I said, "Is that's not fair. They all pay taxes. Even if they're renters, they pay their tax through their landlord. 
They're all taxpayers. And we need to make sure that we distribute those resources fairly. So we came up with this program called the Community Parks Initiative, and we tore that park from the ground and rebuilt it up, period. The, we were allowed to do 67. The good news when I left as commissioner, the mayor funded another 100 parks to get closer to that 215. This program was transformative. I will get emotional at times when I talk about it because I know how impactful it was to the communities. So there's your Robert Moses playground. Isn't it fun? Won't you want to go there today and roll around on the asphalt and have a good time? <laughs> Question is, is, is that a park or a parking lot? This is what I grew up in, tall fence, asphalt. This was my play space. And guess what? That was in the 10-minute walk matrix. Not right. This one's a little bit better. There are trees and a bench, so I'm sure you can go there, have a picnic, propose. <laughs> Within a 10-minute walk. No, shouldn't count. So if you heard me last night, I kind of said, it shouldn't be a 10-minute walk to a park. It should be a 10-minute walk to a quality park, and then we'll have it. So I came up with this concept called Parks Plus. At the end of the presentation, I'll show you some examples. But we want to make sure that parks serve multiple purposes. Since we're redoing it, let's redo it right. And so we made sure that Parks and Park Playgrounds Plus it was an intentional approach to come with all these new concepts into one space. I'll share with you a couple. One, we want to have a new design president to start introducing some elements. Parks need to be these amazing destinations for children, adult fitness equipment, for adults. We want to use vibrant colors to have it a destination so it's attractive. It's not the gray asphalt, but it's an experience that people want to go to. We want to make sure there's more horticulture and break up the asphalt, have stormwater retention and stormwater capture. And people kept saying, we want more green in our spaces. And just being in green space for 10 minutes improves your mental health. Your stress and anxiety gets reduced. So we made sure we had all of that. And then seating, seating, seating. We resisted those that said, you can't put benches in parks because the homeless may sit there. Really? There's about a thousand in our city. There are nine million people that need to sit, particularly our seniors, people with disabilities, that need a place to gather and to sit and just look at that. We quadrupled the amount of seating because we wanted people to enjoy themselves and have places for seniors to sit so they can age gracefully and enjoy the beauty of our parks. So here's an example in the Bronx. This is a, now a transitioning neighborhood near a community college. And this is one of our community park transformations. So there's the entrance, kind of foreboding, not a very pleasant place to be. Unlike the other parks that were all asphalt, this one had vegetation. <laughs> Unfortunately, it looked like this. When I told you I wouldn't let my child or grandchild step foot in a park, that's what I was talking about. I was furious and angry and embarrassed as a commissioner that I qualified as a park. It should have been shut off and abandoned, but we were able to focus and redesign the park. Based on the principles I'll share with you later, multi-generational, it's near a college. We made sure we had a square. There's ping pong, there's seating areas for the seniors, there's spray features for the kids. And this is the park. We took away a lot of those steps and introduced more uh, at-grade ramps. So if you have a walker or a stroller, you can get into the park. This was the concept design. You see the the, the community college in the background, and it was open during COVID, but here's the finished product. And the thing is that most of the students didn't even know this space existed. And imagine the connections, the memories, the relationships are going to be formed now that that exists. Neglected for 20 years. 20 years. And now the community is proud to have a quality space that they can enjoy. Before I get to the next slide, I'll share with you, there was another playground in Brooklyn, asphalt playground like you've seen. And on opening day, we have a big event. I mean, balloons, food, it's a big deal for us. And it was a boy Hispanic about eight years old that would not come into the park on opening day. I mean, for us, this is a celebration. So I asked one of my park workers to go to the little boy to ask him, why won't you come in? And what the little boy said, he didn't know how much it cost to go into that park because he thought he had to pay. Nothing that nice existed in his neighborhood. And there is the park. 
and there's a little boy running around that track. Imagine the joy knowing that he did not have to pay, and he and his friends can go there every single day. The minute he knew, him and his father came in, the boy kept running around the track, and to know the joy that you can give a community that had been deprived for decades, this simple act will help change the community. By the way, the crime in the neighborhood relating to these parks went down. When you respect a community with quality material, they respect you back in return. And in fact, a lot of them became stewards. Of these parks, 82 had friends groups that helped love and steward and care for the parks once we opened it. I always made the kids do a pledge, and they proudly would say they're gonna make sure that if anyone tries to mess with their park, they will approach them and say, this is our park, please take care of it. Usership increased, and before I left as commissioner, we finished 62 of 67, and believe me, I cannot even tell you the stories. I shared another one last night. It is powerful. It changed the community. They now had their space, their own, where they felt welcome, that they can thrive, thrive as a community. I do want to touch about placemaking because this is something very important. I spoke to Scott and others and the design studio. We have to recognize that placemaking, reimagining the public realm, is so crucial to how you start to really look at the public realm, the public space in your city. Create an experience, placekeeping should be authentic and memorable. I love the architecture throughout the city. You don't need anywhere USA, from the choo-choo to where I'm staying at the YMCA, and these are things you want to keep, placekeeping. They're memorable, make sure, because not a the city has that. Your bridges, I walked over the Walnut Street Bridge. Yes, loved it. Power of 10. Does anybody know what the Power of 10 is? If you don't, I'm gonna tell you. Power of 10, every city should have 10 destinations with 10 things to do in each destination. Look at your parks. Make sure that when you're there, you want to attract multiple users where people feel welcome, 10 things to do in each destination. People-centered, reimagine the public realm, all critical. I believe that people may eat and sleep in their apartments, but you live in the public realm. Your civic spaces, your urban spaces, your green spaces, your parks, that's where you live. And if that's the case, we need to pay more attention because that's why people want to be there. I believe previous generations were consumers of goods. We love buying stuff, but the younger generations are consumers of experiences. That's why I want to come to Chattanooga. I love the experience. I'm coming back. I don't have a job, but I want to move to that city. The experience is key. So I tell my staff, you're not just planners and designers, but you're now experienced builders. I went on a tour today, and I did have a recommendation. I can't wait for you to reimagine Ross Landing, a great open space. I see a lot of heads nodding. A lot of concrete, it's very attractive. Uh, <laughs> and when I joined the firm, our tagline was creating experiences through experiences. Oh, I'm in the right place. And so now I have the privilege, now that I'm not commissioner, that I help the firm just come up with creating these experience, experiences in all these great public spaces. So I'm very delighted to see that tagline. But I do want to talk about access. Why did I put that picture up there? That's literary walk in Central Park. I used to take my walk there every day. Oh, okay, let me stop looking. All right, so <laughs> reimagine the public space. Most people don't realize how much of the city is in the public realm. And we want to make sure, like this is in the Flatiron District, and that was underperforming asphalt concrete. It was used for cars. And just by rethinking its use, putting up some tables and chairs. This is now an amazing destination when people come to. We didn't have to buy the land, we already owned it. It was just underperforming, concrete, a traffic island, and we didn't have to acquire land, we just reimagined how to use it. Now this is New York City, and I'd like you to do analysis of yours if the design studio or parks didn't do it yet. Parks represented 14% of the city, streets and sidewalks 26%. 40% of New York City was public space in the public realm. But we didn't act that way. That 26% dominated for cars, and we said, no, 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 this is public space, not car space, public space. So we're now gonna reimagine, this is movement, from the 50-minute walk and to 25 by 25, where you're seeing more and more cities reclaiming 
public space for the public, not exclusively for cars, and you're seeing amazing things happening. So in New York City, when I became commissioner, I couldn't believe it, but uh, I read the ordinance, and it said the sidewalk adjacent to the park is under jurisdiction of the Parks Department. I was like, yes! <laughs> I called my general counsel, I called the transportation commissioner, and she said, yes. I said, staff, we're gonna do some magic. But it was Olmsted in our research that said the sidewalk adjacent to the park should be considered the outer park. Memo to staff, we're now gonna start reimagining the outer park. That's Rufus King Park. We now create a bioswale because it's not a sidewalk, it's an outer park. And then I took aim on these gates and fences. New York City is gate and fence happy, I don't get it. There's a little dog, just wants to sniff some grass, but they have to walk another five minutes just to get in the entrance. Open space is open, it's not cage, but New York City, oh. So I always scratched my head when I saw this slide. I had a feeling the Parks Department thought the trees were gonna run away at night, so they just put a, put a fence around it. Then you had to duck, this is now a butterfly garden. We opened it up and changed it. And then when I announced this initiative that we were gonna to start to look at the edges and fences in New York City, you know, the old timers, because back in the 70s and 80s, New York was a dangerous place, you're gonna make the park less safe, really? Do you see what's happening to that person halfway down the block? You can't, because the fence obscures your sight line. It's time to take down or lower the fences. And we did. The program I came up with was called Parks Without Borders. It was a simple program. As part of NYC, you know, we couldn't get the this, this city to initially fund it, so I recommended a pilot. Scott, great way to start a program. I don't know if the elected officials are here. You just do a pilot to see how it works. In this case, we did a pilot. Not only was it successful, it's now part of the Parks Department's design philosophy on all of our parks. So what is Parks Without Borders? It's looking at the entrances, edges, and adjacent park spaces as a design approach. And so we now knew the sidewalk, the edges, we wanted our parks to be more accessible to the public. For entrances, we look carefully at the fences and gates, except for sports or where kids would play or steep slopes. We examined very closely as a fence needed to be here, and it didn't make any sense. We took it down or we lowered it. What did that do? We knew the sidewalk was the outer park, so we put benches on the sidewalk. Parks close, sidewalks never close. And so for us, what we loved about it, for women and seniors in particular, they like to see their surroundings. They want to have a clear sight line, and the police loved it because now they can just walk by and quickly surveil the fence versus having these high perimeter fences with spikes. And so this was a great way for us to just make the park safer by lowering the edges. And then we took these wrapped, uh, just these dioramas behind a fence, moved them down and opened up gardens in the edge of parks for the public to enjoy, particularly near community centers and bus stops, transformative. So here's an example of Travers Park. This one is so successful, they now want to create an entire linear park and close off the street. That's how popular this park, this project was. So this was a great effort for us. Uh, I would love to have a director of the public realm, but instead we worked with different departments. There was a park, a street, and a schoolyard. We merged them all together to create one larger three-acre park. Uh, there it is, your typical Robert Moses playground again. You have the Belgian block, tall fence, a little dog again that just can't sniff any grass. Take note to where those trees are located. Take note to where those trees are located. So here is the concept. Do you see how we brought the entire park out into the sidewalk? The trees, which were just sitting in isolation, now have beautiful landscape tree wells. Because parks are outdoor living rooms, we made sure that all the benches don't go side by side. It always bothered me like saying, Scott, how you doing? Oh, I'm good, okay, Eric, how you doing? Oh, I'm, no, I wanna have a conversation like a living room. Do you do that in your house, put all the benches on one side? It's a conversation, it's now to, so we made sure we had these nice nooks, took down the fence, molded, had pole and chain, which is another delicate way of saying, don't walk on the grass, but you don't have a high fence. And the street that was closed, which they used for informal events, we formalized it to connect the park and the schoolyard. Now there are all sorts of festivals and events 
that happen in this space. And that's the edge. And there it is. The park is closed. Would you know it? The sidewalk is open. Different ages, having conversations, enjoying themselves. That used to be an unhospitable 15-foot fence. And now, by thinking of parks a different way, of making it more accessible, this park is so popular, the street that you see there, 3rd or 4th Avenue, they literally want to close it off and create a linear park because this was that successful. And now we see this movement throughout the city. We took away 8,000 parking spaces for play streets, for shared streets, for open streets, because we recognize the streets belong to people, not just cars, and now we're reclaiming our city. <laughs> Broad Street may be a great place to experiment this concept. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I shared with some folks yesterday that uh, I do a lot of listening circles, because I don't believe in surveys. I believe in listening to the public whether you do in your community centers or in the neighborhood, don't have them come to you, you should go to them. But this is one I gave in uh, uh, Akron, Ohio. Inclusion. Inclusion to me is to be included and not excluded. For all people, the design process, avoid designing exclusive parks in public spaces. And to me, the telltale sign is I feel welcome here, I belong here. And I do that when I go into spaces. And what I like about Chattanooga, I feel welcome here, and there are spaces that I said to myself, I belong here. But I need to spend more time so I can be honest by saying, don't know about this space. But that's something that is the telltale sign, having this sense of belonging. So I talked about access, and people saw me today taking pictures of signs. Uh, I was shocked. In New York City, we had a sign in our park that said you could not loiter. I get private property, but a park? Now, as you can see, the word loitering means to sit or stand idly by without apparent purpose. Newsflash, that's what you do in a park. <laughs> but if you're the wrong type of park goer, that rule can be weaponized and racialized. And that's exactly what was happening in New York. So the good news, in 2017, the city council agreed under our Criminal Justice Reform Act to remove loitering as a rule in our park to tell our teenagers, you're welcome here. You're welcome here. And in fact, and there's another sign which we stopped. You, we now have a sign committee because no hats permitted on basketball courts or hoodies or things like that. We made sure we had a committee where not a rogue employee would create a sign that did not get approval to make our employees, I mean our park goers not feel welcome. So the loitering bothered me, so guess what we did? We started a yes loitering project <laughs> to engage our teenagers about how they feel excluded from or targeted in public space. If parks are for all, are teens part of all? And so we had that conversation during COVID, by the way, and this was an amazing project and we got a lot of good information about how we can let our teens feel welcome in our public space if we truly believe in inclusion. Remember, it's not what you do, <laughs> it's who you are. Oh, this sign. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I don't know where this sign came from. It made me so angry when I saw this. I actually wanted to have a concession and a stand where you can rent a child to go into the park. <laughs> All I know is that this was not being inclusive or welcoming. We took these signs down and we changed them and just put them in the play space where the children were playing and not the perimeter of the park where these were located. That one change opened up 512 additional parks where you were not welcome if you were an adult without a child. That was not fair and so we changed it. I'm gonna end on reflections to kind of elevate the importance of parks and I'll go to some of the examples of some of the transformations we've made in New York City. I'm gonna be honest with you, 2020 was probably the lowest point in my life between running an agency during COVID where 800 people a day were dying of COVID and other places were saying it's not real. It's just, just come to New York. Just come to New York just, and see for yourselves. It was traumatizing to my staff. I had to come to work. Then it was the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and just the Black Lives Matter protest in parks. It was overwhelming and I cannot begin to tell you how painful it was just to go through that, that period. 
Finally, at my lowest point in August of 2020, when honestly I just didn't know how to get out of bed and go to the office, I reached out to a public health professional. After going through some conversations, we decided to have this session, not just for me, but for staff. I had forgotten how to take care of myself because I was so busy, family, friends, staff, et cetera. It was overwhelming. And I don't know if you can see all these words, but the class showed to me that what is the natural reactions to stress? Now, all of us need stress and anxiety. You have a deadline, you need that adrenaline flowing. Pro prolonged stress leads to anxiety, and prolonged anxiety leads to trauma. And in all of our isolation, we all went through it, we all started experiencing this trauma. Exhaustion, emotional outburst, social withdrawal, trouble concentrating, memory problems, irritability or anger, trouble sleeping, low energy. All these issues were affecting what was happening to the citizens of New York, what was happening to my staff, what was happening to me, and what was happening to some of you. And I realized that we had to figure out somehow to play a role because this was real. It made me even more trouble when I realized we were going through two years of trauma. What about communities that have been going through generational trauma? How have they dealt with living in neighborhoods or in poverty or historically underserved communities and dealing with generations of trauma? So it got very real. Little did I know there was something called a Trauma Stewardship Institute. And we took that class too. And it starts saying, you know, spend time with animals. So we brought little kittens and puppies into the office for people to pet, oh my goodness, and laugh, admire art. So we pivoted as a parks department to say, if we're truly fun, healthy, and happy, how are we going to help people deal in a small measure to some of this trauma? So we're here, you know, please take a picture. This was helpful. Cultivate relationships. Go outside. That's us, parks. And now you have the Department of Parks and Outdoors. And we knew that we can play a role in helping the community get through it through our parks. So I challenged staff to do cool things. One, we recognized that parks and greenways became our sanctuaries of sanity because parks have the power to heal and bring joy. I went a step further and just wrote an article in a book that parks should be considered part of our healthcare system. And we need to think of it that way. It should be part of our healthcare system. And so there are now doctors that'll give you a prescription. It's called Parks RX. Don't take a mental health day. Just take a walk in the park. One hour, you'll feel better. Nature bathing is something they call that. So we got creative, <laughs> wanted to do our part. We couldn't hug anybody during COVID. So we put up 2,000 signs on New York City trees to say it's okay to hug me. I mean, the thing went crazy. The press came out. This one woman, when I was being interviewed, she would not let go of the street. She says, I could really feel something. You know, this one, a little foot up. LeVar Burton, you know, he was out there on Instagram taking a picture of the tree. And so by putting on that lens and thinking very differently, we were able to really help our residents during a very, very difficult time. I'm going to stop here for a second because this is something that was very simple but the process wasn't. Right after the death of George Floyd, I was a broken person. I've changed as a result of what happened because finally I can be myself and not hang my identity at the door when I came into the office. I can finally be me. It was liberating and I thank the young people for speaking out. But during that time, all my friends and allies would say, what can I do? What can I do? And I said, wrong question. You should be asking me how do I feel? I just witnessed a black man being murdered on television, being transitioned to his mother. I was calling for her. Don't ask me what you can do. First, ask me, how do I feel? We'll get to the do later. But first, ask me, how do I feel? So we did that with our employees. And we asked them, how do you feel? The stories were painful. I would share with them my personal story. And after a couple of weeks of conversation, Juneteenth was around the corner, 2020, not a national holiday yet. And we decided to create a space for healing, for joy, for protest, for respite. And we found a location, which I had picked in Brooklyn. And I'll never forget when the commissioner of Brooklyn called me. He said, boss, there are 19 benches. I wanted something symbolic. Juneteenth, 19, 19 benches. So we painted the 19 benches, the Pan-African colors. I named it Juneteenth Grove. And for staff ourselves, and there it is in Brooklyn, it's now 
amazing destination that people can go to where people really feel a sense of belonging and welcome. My staff themselves is part of their healing and therapy, Pain of the Benches. And I had the privilege of praying for the tree that I had planted as a way to show the respect for those that had gone before us, but as a way to talk about hope for the future. What is beautiful about Juneteenth Grove is that when Juneteenth became a national holiday, this was the destination citywide everybody wanted to go to. They felt this was a special place. And I passed there after a race and I was overwhelmed and couldn't get a couple of steps. They kind of had to escort me because I was overwhelmed from the joy. It was joy, it was a celebration of Freedom Day that people were experiencing. So I know this is a hard abrupt, but I'm gonna end on these images about the Playground Plus to begin to show you some of the transformation that we're able to accomplish through this equity initiative, both large parks as well as small parks. The Play Brown Cross uh, focused to be not just replacement in kind of dropping a play unit in the middle of a field, but it was inclusive, accessible, equitable, sustainable. We wanted to make these a parks plus, not just a playground, a playground plus. And so uh, this was uh, one in Brooklyn. We love our animals, uh, but you know, these are the vandal proof benches that were put in the 70s by a previous commissioner, which were the ones I probably hated the most. You know, bad things happen. There was a crime scene, and so we went in there, uh, look at the benches, the fence, and we were able to do this. People were shocked. In fact, a friend of mine who moved away said if she knew for her son that that park was gonna be like that, she wouldn't have moved to Texas. She loved it. Uh, here's just more examples. You see the benches I was talking about? Lots of seating, people, and there they are, around the table, uh, low fence, all the things I share with you, new play features that are unique, that the kids just absolutely enjoy. Wherever you see a play feature, you see lots of seating, so the parents, grandparents, guardians can sit there and enjoy themselves. This is one in the Bronx, this is before. Just plop a unit in the middle. It has so much potential. Don't just replace it with a new unit. Create a playground plus, a park plus. You know, here's another image of what it used to look like. Uh, here's the design concept of why we wanted to maximize it and not just make it a asphalt or replacement in kind is what we call it. And here's the finished product. I still cannot believe how much we packed in this little space. So when I tell you that people are now not vandalizing these parks and loving it, this is now what they have in return where they call it their summer vacation where they go each day. How my staff had a track and said the third turf in this one is beyond me, but they were able to do it. Remember Power of 10? Get as many destinations and activities in a space so different ages, different uses could attract different people so it makes it a great destination you can come to back again and again. Oh my goodness. I can't believe someone at one point thought this was a good park design, but it was. This is Luther Gulick who was the inventor of basketball. And so this is the design. Uh, we now playing with safety surface. I know you do, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, crushed uh, mulch. But, if, but in New York, we're required to do safety surface, so we use it to have a very uh, good color palette. And so this is what the park looked like today from what it was before. Uh, ping pong tables. All that, by the way, is stormwater retention. I told you it does multiple purposes. And then this was a tree I was going to say it needs to go. They begged me not to, and now I loved how we were able to design it. And they used this as a holiday tree, and so I'm glad it stayed in. And then once again, I told you we love seating, 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 seating. We want people to loiter in our parks. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, this is one in northern Manhattan. I don't know what these, you know, sometimes you send your staff off to visit Europe and they come back and say, I have a cool idea. I saw these red serpentine. It's like, oh, this one was bad. Uh, and it was horrible because we do two to five and five to 12 year old play areas. Could you imagine a mother sitting there in the middle, she has a kid that's seven and one that's five and she's going like this. This park made absolutely no sense. And I remember the day we unveiled the design, this little boy about 12 was saying, mommy, is that for us? Why did he say that? This is what it looked like then. And here was the design. We did a little opening. That area where you see at the entrance, that lobby, 
That's part of the sidewalk. That will never close. If you want to sit there, you can. We were able to take advantage of the space. And this is what it looks like today, completed project. This is one of our anchor parks. It's more of a regional destination park. And now it is ever so popular. I believe this is the last one. Once again, your standard seven-foot spiked fence to keep the trees safe. <laughs> and I can go again and again. This one I'm most proud of. Handball is very popular. Bruce, the sandwich shop, I just met him. All he could talk about was a handball. He's a real New Yorker. Uh, anyway, <laughs> this was once again a very dead space. and not a very attractive, unuseful. And so we came up with this theme where we had a running track, we had this water theme, which I usually don't do, but I let my staff go away with it. And I don't like handball walls because it blocks view, but they said, we have an idea, you're gonna love it, and I did. So what they did was, we lowered the fence, remember seven foot fence, now it's open, you can see right through it. And they took the handball wall and put a mosaic tile as a backdrop to the water feature. It pops, and when people walk to this park, they're like, what? Did, did you buy more land? I said, no. We just reimagined it very differently. And so now that's the water feature and the water play. Uh, once again, lots of seating, using color to make it inviting and attractive. Remember, these were all spaces that had seen investment in over two decades, and now they become this prideful community destination that all can enjoy. I told you, we do the outer park, we do the sidewalk, we lower the fence, but now we also make sure we do the sidewalk with new street trees, we put new sidewalks in, because to me, you don't want to build a house and leave your porch in a state of disrepair, so we make sure it's all complete. So that brings me to the end. It is my goal, and hopefully now your goal, to create an equitable, inclusive, and resilient parks and public spaces that are accessible to all, and has the power to heal and bring joy to both present and future generations. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, and I, I, I appreciate it because I cannot begin to tell you, being in a profession that, that brings me personal joy, I'm on a mission, so when people ask me to come to a place to speak, I want to share with you what I've experienced, and I tell you, all of this is real. I have more stories. I do want to do a couple of shout outs. I met Stroud for the first time. I hear you're a legend here. Pleasure to meet you. My friend from New York, B. Laurie. And then Mayor Littlefield, we met some years ago, and that's the first time I said, after hearing Mayor speak, I said, I got to come to Chattanooga. Such a passionate advocate, so was, and a planner, so you know, you know he's got to be cool. All right, uh, I don't know if we have time for questions. Let me go to, we do. We have time for questions. I think the venue is intimate enough where I'll be able to hear you, so I don't know if you'll need a mic. Yes, sir. Well, let me go back to say that the parking spots were eliminated for the outdoor dining sheds. That was the driver for it. We did close off initially 60 miles of streets during COVID, but the 8,000 miles, I mean, 8,000 spots were all the stalls that we lost through the outdoor parking sheds because, because of COVID. People loved it so much. They didn't want to give up the parking spots and wanted to keep it because it added a very nice vibe, parklets, so to speak. And so we just, no, clearly New York City has a major transportation system. Not everyone needs a car. I don't think the same thing can be done, but on a smaller scale, having these parklets or outdoor dining sheds, particularly on streets that don't have a lot of street trees, to me is something very important. But we work for a mayor. The mayor said this is what's gonna be done, and then you just do it. Regardless of your department, there's really no pushback. But in New York City, there was a lot of collaboration between the agencies. That's something we always enjoyed. So that was primarily Department of Transportation. But for parks, we did close off some streets in parks, adjacent to parks, but Department of Transportation and another agency, building department, handled regulating the outdoor sheds. But now if you go to New York, they're still there. 
they haven't gone away, and now it's becoming part, not just New York, but more places now having these outdoor sheds and parklets, because it adds a certain vibe and energy uh, to some locations. Yes? I have to say thousands, it's hard to say. Between Little League, it's New York City, nine million people, you can imagine. Well, I'll put it this way. We have a fight every year just issuing all of our permits because it's a waiting list. And you saw how many fields we have. Uh, so it's tough, and now we have some emerging sports. Cricket is coming in, lacrosse, and others that we did not expect are emerging. So we have a tough time, but I'll just put it this way, is a waiting list. So we always prioritize children first, then we do the adult leagues second, and just, just how we do it. But all of our sports fields or courts, it's overwhelming uh, how much demand there is. And so they go to our informal fields, which we don't like because soccer can tear up your turf. We prefer it to be on a synthetic turf. But we just can't keep up with demand. So I would say thousands. I, I don't know the number. Yes, sir. Ooh. There's something called the Custodians Union. And we tried working with Trust for Public Land. We did some schoolyards, uh, playgrounds to schoolyards conversion, but the custodian, school by school, the principal and a union has to agree. Otherwise, we can't do it. I always got frustrated because to me, that seems like it's public private space. The taxpayers pay for it. How can you, the union or principal, determine how you use that taxpayer space. So that was something that was my undone issue before I left because it was a union issue. But for us, where we can convert a playground, schoolyard to a playground, we will. And we have what's called joint use agreements for those spaces. But parks would have to pay the custodian to manage that space if it was on Department of Education's property. Very, it's unfair. It's unfair, and we pay taxpayers money. How dare you determine whether we can use public space or not? So that is a very hot topic. <laughs> Why did you bring that up? That really just made me. <laughs> Good question, but this is a common issue in many places. Uh, they came safety reasons, but it's great for fields and other sports areas that you can now open it up and make it available to the general public. It's just figuring out the political will and logistics about how to do it. Yes. You mentioned how you can't separate the recreation from the parks when you first started. No, I, there's community centers. Uh, that for me was as I was going through, because we were talking early in the day about how can you start working and building better relationships with the communities. And you know, I said that you know you have community centers, and that's where park staff can start to build those relationships as you talk about future master planning. And then I believe I heard that the community centers are run by one agency and then the park outdoor space is run by another agency and I was just surprised by that. So, my question is why. You want to have one staff maintaining an entire space indoor outdoor, plus from my perspective, uh, where we built some of the most powerful relationships was our recreation staff working directly with the community seniors, adults, our programs, summer camps, but they also become places where we have community conversations. And so I just believe to start to build that entree because parks are, and now outdoors is so important that those become the locations, the anchors of where you start to build that relationship. So when I heard it, I hadn't heard it before. I know there were some cities that separate pools and same thing in Philadelphia. I said the same thing to Philadelphia. Uh, you, to me, uh, I used to say that fragmented government produces fragmented results. Systematic thinking and teaming together makes the most sense. So in that particular case, I certainly believe that that is something that for, for the mission of the Parks and Rec Department and outdoors, to me there should be some role or some uh, ownership uh, of the community centers. And again, that's my perspective. I'm here to give advice. You can take it, not take it. I'm just sharing you my perspective.
Okay. Yes. So there was a question. First of all, enjoyed my tour so much for downtown. We had all of our tour guys and just loving it. And yes, if you invite me to come back, yes, I will come back. Uh, but in terms of street trees, uh, there are some cities, uh, Melbourne, for example, they wanted the public to have a relationship with their trees. So they set up a system where you can literally write your local tree a love letter. But here's the great part. The tree will write you back. <laughs> and in New York City, we undertook a tree census, every single tree. That's why I know there's 667,000 trees in New York. We did a census of all our trees. We do it every 10 years. One, to identify the species, but two, that you can go online, find your local tree, it's geocoded, and if you water it, you can respond. If you put mulch on it, you can respond. But it's our way of having better stewards to take care of our street trees because they're abused. You know, dog urine, bicycle chains, I mean, they are some resilient. And we want to keep them because trees, that one tree, air quality, water quality, absorb carbon dioxide, besides the beauty and the heat, it cools off the city. So they're probably our best allies. And so it was our way, both in Melbourne and New York, that we want the residents to have a relationship with their street tree. So if you want, just go out there and write. I think it was Brisbane. I'm sorry, not Melbourne, but it's Brisbane. They actually have that you can write your local tree a love letter and fall in love with your local tree. <laughs> So the mayor on his platform ran on a tale of two cities. And when he approached me about taking the job, he told me that his number one priority was equity. But I had to figure out how to do it, and you saw what the outcome was. But I've been doing this my entire life and knew when he said equity, I was saying fairness. And fairness is a very easy concept to explain. Equity isn't. I speak to people, and there's food equity, this equity, that equity, that, oh my goodness. They just attach the word equity thinking, we got it. We're sending a message. It's not equitable. We want to be crystal clear. This is about fairness. And we had to show, is it right? Is it right that that community got this investment? And this community did not. The other thing we had this conversation earlier, said, what about downtown versus the neighbors? No. For economic development reasons, you need to do downtown development, but also neighbor development. It's not either or. It's both. So the message is, as you go out to look for the next wave of development, yes, take your economic catalyst because you want to be able to bring more resources into the city so it could be spread fairly, but you also have to pick those places that had not seen any capital investment in decades. That came from the mayor, and that was a charge to me, and we executed it. And the current mayor is continuing on that same legacy because people saw the outcome, and for them to stop it now, Oh, no, you're not. We saw the benefits. We see the joy. We see the reduced crime. We see it. Why would you take that away? So it took, for us, it took some time. It requires political will and saying that this is our budget, has to have state good repair, economic development reasons, and now fairly distributed. What's the capital program? So you can do all of those and not just put one against the other. It can be done because it's been done. New York, Philadelphia, Minneapolis, San Francisco. I can go on to Detroit. <laughs> They're doing it. DC. If you keep me up here, I'll name some more cities. It's being done. <laughs> Raleigh. I was co-chair of the Parks Bond. It just passed two days ago. $275 million. Of the 275, uh, close to 90 million went to underserved communities. Uh, and so they were the biggest district in the city that got the biggest amount of cash because of the years of underinvestment. So it can be done. Thank you. I can stay up here all night. Y'all are so nice. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> so
So I'll turn it back over to you, David. I'm here as long as you want me here, and I know they're scooting me off to dinner, but just want to say it's been a delight. I've been enjoying from the walking tours today to meeting so many wonderful people during lunch and last night. Uh, thank you all for your hospitality, uh, and thank you all for just listening to me for the past 45 minutes or so. Thank you. It has been a treat and an honor to see each of you here tonight for this event. On your seats, there's a sort of a placard, and that's taken uh, posters we've had in the past for previous earlier civic events that the staff at the studio created. Uh, we hope you'll take it as a keepsake. There's incidentally a QR symbol on the back if you'd like to update your information with us or make a donation, um, just so we have your information, okay? Um, it is great to see everyone here tonight. Thank you so much, Mitchell. Have a good evening. We'll see you in February. Bye.